Good morning, everyone. Are you awake? No. <laughs> Had some breakfast? A little bit. That helps wake up a little bit. Some coffee. So good to see you. I'm awake because I went to bed early, and, but then I got up quite early, so <laughs> it all evens out. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of my world. So this is the city of Glasgow where I live. This is kind of the main section. It's called Buchanan Street. It's very famous. It's second to London in shopping and very expensive shopping at that. And that's where we live. We live just to the west of that, West End. So about a 10 minute ride on the tube, the subway. And uh, that's our world. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a Scottish you know, Scottish little phrases are so quaint and delightful. So here's one for you. You have to use a little symbol and you use your finger like this, everybody. And you go, you say to somebody, cock a wee finger, will ye? <laughs> cock a wee finger, will ye? And you wave your little finger at them. Cock a wee finger, will ye? Try that with me. Cock a wee finger, will ye? <laughs> Once more, cock a wee finger, will ye? Anybody have a clue what that might mean? Yeah, originally it meant, I want to offer you a cup of tea. It's kind of deteriorated through sin. <laughs> it now means I want to buy you whiskey. <laughs> so I don't advocate that, but the tea's all right. And uh, <laughs> so try once more and think of these good Scottish folk wandering around Buchanan Street. Uh, my son, if he was here, he's feeling a little ill, so he slept in, but... He would say, I've not heard that. Well, it's kind of the older generation. So if you're in a pub and somebody comes up to you, cock a wee finger with you, they want to buy you a whiskey. So you have to decide how you're going to respond to that. <laughs> uh, so that's our world. Let's uh, pray and just invite the Lord to, by His Spirit, help us delve into this powerful text. You can open up to Colossians 2, uh, verses 6 to 15, we're going to focus on in just a few moments. Lord, thank you so much for another morning, this Wednesday of our first week, and yeah, we're so uh, happy, God, to be engaging with each other, engaging in music and discussion and biblical ideas and relationships. We're, we're really blessed and we want to give you the thanks. And even as we come to this passage in Colossians 2, we know that it is your Holy Spirit who is really our teacher. So I pray that whatever I have to offer will just inspire through your Holy Spirit's work uh, to apply these truths to our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, yesterday we concluded with my little quotation from Wilmus, Uncle Wilmus Chehi, uh, about Jesus reigning in the lives of students. This morning I want to start off this way with an invitation that was extended to me by Wilmus, and then a bit of the story that followed. So have Dear Wilmus, in your minds as you're hearing this wee story. Um, I think it was my third summer at Chehi as a student. And so I was, you know, pretty well versed in how things worked and all that. But the very first Sunday, we all arrive on Sunday, I was one of the earlier ones there. And Uncle Wilmus came to me in his typical fashion, put his arm around my shoulder. And he said, son, let's take a walk. And then a walk with Wilmus that took about 25 minutes, in which he asked me all about my life, my church, my family. He asked about my trombone playing, how it was coming, my singing side. And he asked about my trust in Christ and my growth in Christ over the last years since I'd been at Chehi. And then he came to really the major points of why he wanted to talk with me and take me on this little walk excursion. He said, now son, will you spend time with a new chap who's coming whose name is Reggie Halperin? And he went on to describe Reggie. Reggie was a 15-year-old student 
from New Jersey. He was a cello player. He was one of those guys, Che, he always has a few of them, he could grow a beard in one day <laughs> at the age of 15. <laughs> like, you know, by supper time, he needed to shave again after first thing in the morning. He was one of those, you know, testosterone boys. And, uh, but he was a very troubled young teen, and, and Wilmus asked me, would I just kind of give him special attention and invite other guys who were strong in faith to surround him a wee bit. And so that summer and in the successive one or two summers after that, we saw Reggie become an ardent follower of Jesus. To be honest, his cello playing only improved slightly because <laughs> he wasn't too disciplined about that. But he really grew in faith. And then the second point that Wilmus had for why he wanted this walk with me, again, he put his arm around me to make sure I wouldn't be too, too offended. He, he said, now, Wesley, you would like to get your hair cut for dear Uncle Wilmus, won't you? Because <laughs> I had very long hair. And I still do on occasion, but uh, at that point it was, you know, really... <laughs> ponytail long and it wasn't a rule or anything he just thought it detracted a bit from what Jay stood for now Wesley you really do want to get your hair cut for dear old Uncle Wilmus and of course I was like of course I do <laughs> the very next day Monday I was escorted to uh, Williamsport where there was a barber and just <laughs> really short nice haircut well, that was a walk I still think about today. Of course, I would cut my hair for my dear mentor man who's just so invested in my life. But also that he was so concerned about Reggie. He wasn't even there yet, and he wanted me to take special time with him and a few others. A walk that I think about what that stands for, cared and nurtured and and sharing of Jesus in relationship kind of ways. We come now to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15 as our text this morning. It, it really is the thematic heart of this Colossian letter, this passage. And it uses this very metaphor of walking, doesn't it? Even in similar ways to what I've just described with Uncle Wilmus. And let's read the passage, and then I'll try to uh, just draw out some of the most important truths I think come from it for us today. Chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. Now, you, therefore, as you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, hollow and deceptive philosophy, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh from the circum by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. And he, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through 
him. The thematic statement for the whole of Colossians is this imperative that you see in verse 6. Look at that with me again. In verse 6, that those who claim Christ are to actually begin to walk in Christ or to continue in all that it means to walk, to keep walking in him. So what does this language of walking mean? It's become kind of colloquial, at least in evangelical circles. We'd ask somebody, tell me about your walk with Christ. Have you ever thought, what do you mean by that? <laughs> you take a walk down the street? It is the Greek imperative, listen to this carefully, peripatete, or from the root peripateo. Peri pateo, from which we derive our English idea of the perimeter of something. So it clearly suggests in its New Testament usage the full circumference of life, the perimeter of it. That is, an ongoing relationship with Jesus that is entirely holistic, encompassing virtually everything. Young women, young men, if you are walking in Christ, your relationship with Jesus touches upon everything in your life, not just certain and restricted compartments, but the perimeter, the peripateo kind of living where you walk in Jesus. It touches everything, your closest relationships, your aspirations and your dreams, your involvement in your community culture and your school life, your thought life, your behavior, and yes, of course, your music making. Walking in Christ has everything to do with how and why you make music. But to do justice to this particular text, we must see that this imperative to walk in Christ is prefaced, isn't it, by a transitional clause in which Paul almost conditions it at the beginning of verse 6, so then, just as you received Christ... So walk in him. What does the apostle have in mind in introducing this theme in this transitional, quasi-conditional way? With such a stress on what it meant to these young Colossian Christians to have received Christ. Well, there are probably two ways to understand this. One of them is to understand that it probably harkens back to Paul's discussion about the mystery of Christ, first uh, intoned by him back in chapter 1. So I'll ask you to turn back to chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It's also referenced in chapter 2, verse 2, this idea of the mystery of of Christ. Can you look at that with me in your Bibles back in chapter 1, 26, 27? That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to the saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which was largely the people of Colossae, Colossae. And then he tells us what that mystery is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is what receiving Christ is about. It is the mystery of Christ indwelling you. Christ indwelling you. It's the essence of being 
one who walks with him, his follower. Being a Christ follower is not simply about professed beliefs. It is that, but it is so much more than that. Or accord with both rational and even supernatural doctrines of what we're taught. It is about the wonderful and exhilarating mystery of Christ coming into a human being's spirit, soul, body, being. Christ in you, the hope of glory, says the text. Christ living out his life through you, through your personality, through your style, through your history, through your unique demonstration of the image of God. It is a supernatural experience and a reality. It is experiential. Jesus comes in. And so Paul calls it a mystery. But there is another stress that is clearly suggested in this particular text that informs, I think, what receiving Christ means in this Pauline language. He says specifically, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, ton kurian, I want you to learn that simple Greek phrase, the Lord, ton kurian. Could you just say that, get that under your tongue? Ton kurian. Lord is kurios, this is the accusative, so we put it in ton kurian. Jesus, the Lord. Yes, Jesus, your friend. Yes, Jesus who loves you. Yes, Jesus who walks beside you. Yes, Jesus who, who is this amazing human and God at the same time. But he is, in Paul's language, the Lord. So hugely significant throughout the New Testament for our understanding of and our approach to this Jesus whom we receive. Literally, more fully, it is ton Christan Yesun ton Kurian. The Christ Jesus, the Lord. The Christ Jesus, the Lord. Ton Christan Yesun ton Kurian with such a stress that one of the premier New Testament scholars in the world today, his name is Douglas Moo, teaches at Wheaton Graduate School, translates it this way, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Young men and women, to walk in Christ means that you walk in step with one who is Ton Kurian, the Lord in your life. Douglas Moo again puts it this way, quoting him, the polemical context in which Paul writes justifies our seeing in this language an exclusive, exclusive emphasis typical of this letter as a whole. Let Christ and no other, for he is Lord. Establish your values, guide your thinking, direct your conduct. Let Christ and no other, for he is Lord. To which I would add, let Christ and no other distinguish your direction in life, fix your affections, Stimulate your dreams. Stretch your horizons and set your boundaries at the same time. Determine whether you will marry and who you will marry. 
If you follow Jesus seriously, your first call, your first instruction in the whole field of romance is to decide, should I marry? Paul says to us, I advise you do as I have done so that you are free and not marry. Have you considered that? Kind of strong, isn't it? <laughs> now, if God gives you that one, man, go for it. But the first question is not who you marry, but whether you marry if you are a Christ follower. Our world of church today assumes marriage. And of course, I'm married. I have a wonderful wife named Cynthia, who I met at Chehi, by the way. Five kids. I'm all for it, but I really want to urge the church ought to take seriously singleness. And certainly not exclude the singles who have so much uh, to offer and also their unique challenges that we need to stand beside and bless and encourage. So I have a little bit of hard news for you. I hope some of you don't marry because of your call to Jesus. That's pretty radical, isn't it? Let Christ and no other, for he is Lord, determine whether you marry and who you marry. And yes, of course, let Christ, because he is Lord and no other, fill your music, become the purpose of your music, become the reason for music making. He is Lord. Now, there is one last determinant that is in Paul's mind as to what walking in Christ means. And we see it in verse 7. If you go back to chapter 2 now, we were in chapter 1 there for a wee bit, but go back to chapter 2, verse 7. He puts it in terms of, verse 6, As therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, verse 7, having been firmly rooted, now being built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. And it is this, it is this notion of the faith, which is the entire focus of the rest of this passage, not as in some of your versions, maybe even the version you're using puts it, your faith. All I can tell you is that is not accurate. <laughs> it is te piste, the faith. Because the faith that Paul is writing about, the faith, meaning the Christian faith in terms of the content of what one believes rather than the act of believing here. Do you understand the difference of that? When we say have faith, we're maybe meaning the act of believing, of trusting, and that's, of course, hugely part of it. But that is not what Paul is saying here. He's talking about the content being built up in the historic Christian Jesus-focused faith. Because the faith meaning the content of Christian faith, is at odds with what might be the whole reason for this letter to the Colossians. It is at odds with the reason Paul wrote to the Christians at Colossae anyway. It is clear that the letter to the Colossians is addressing what some refer to as the Colossian heresy and others less caustically talk about it as the threat of false teaching, to which the Christians apparently living in Colossae were susceptible. Now indications and demarcations of this heresy or false teaching spring up all through this letter, but here 
in the passage we are reviewing this morning is one of the clearest, most blatant examples of that. As we come to in verse 8, the very next verse, look at it in your Bibles with me. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles, rather than according to Christ. There's some kind of debate, honest kind of scholarly Bible study debate, as to what the Colossian heresy or false teaching actually was in particular. But the majority of New Testament scholars today now agree, those that take biblical authority really seriously agree, that it was more likely some brand, more than what call serious syncretism. Can anybody tell me what, what is syncretism? Be bold, be brave. <laughs> Any idea what is syncretism? Syncretism is basically the mixing together of two or more, so it could be three or four, but it's usually two, religious or, philosoph or philosophical ideas, stances, beliefs, or traditions. Just mixing them together. So that, for example, in my growing up in the Congo in Africa, it was quite common that Christians there had struggles with just mixing in Christianity's teaching with very strong animistic beliefs in the power of spirits and demons through animals and nature, which really does have a true side, but it was kind of very distorted. And they just added Christian teaching to that and mixed them together apart from what the Bible says. And here in Colossae, it was likely the blending together of Phrygian folk beliefs. Phrygia was the area in which uh, the city of Colossae was. Phrygian folk beliefs, combined with a version of folk Judaism, very legalistic Judaism, some scholars also include it probably had forms of very elite uh, Gnosticism that you can only know God if he gives you secret knowledge that nobody else has. With all intermixing with a very watered down Christianity. And I want to be clear in saying young, women, young men and women and all of us actually today, that I see serious and dangerous syncretism as one of the major challenges to the new generation of Christians today. That is you. Serious problems with just adding a little bit of Jesus to other idols in your life. That's syncretism. He's not the Lord, he's just added in amongst other very important things, even the idol of music. I'd, I'd encourage if I could put Anne on the spot, and I bet if you asked her about idolatry in music worlds, she could tell you a lot how disempowering it is when music, as wonderful it is, becomes the idol. <clears throat> The only one we worship is Jesus the Lord. And then music has its wonderful place under that. Chat with her about that and others of the faculty who are professional musicians. I want to say that again. I see serious and dangerous syncretism as one of the major challenges for the new generation of Christians. That means you. Oh, not usually in the most blatant modes or forms like attempts at meshing Buddhism with Christ or Islam and Christianity or Hinduism and Christian ethics, but in what is perhaps the more subtle and sinister even meshing of Westernisms, 
with what is so evidently nothing but truly watered-down Christianity. With a whole host of idolatries in their wake that come in the form of health and wealth versions of the gospel that belittle the poor. And Western consumptive practices that excuse the rich from the warnings of Jesus that are so blatantly clear in the gospels. And Western religious consumerism that turns faith into total self promotion. And even sexual libertarianism that resorts to and thus distorts the Bible itself. Just mix in a little Jesus with the sexual ethic of today and it'll all be okay. I challenge you, young men and women, don't settle for watered-down Christianity. <clears throat> don't give your life to watered-down Christianity. Why would you do that? It's not worth it. Don't even entertain. Don't cave into that. Jesus, the Lord, is the faith. What is most important for us today is to understand that the Apostle Paul sees that kind of syncretism as inimical to faith, the faith, the real faith. Because the faith is about what is true as opposed to what is false. You cannot mesh truth with error and call it the faith as determined in Christ. It thereby loses all semblance of what can be called Christianity. Christianity. And with all of that again, what is Paul's antidote to this synchristic illness deception? He holds forth, doesn't he? The real Jesus, the exalted Christ. He holds forth the real Jesus as the central truth of the faith, which is what the entire rest of the passage deals with in verses 9 to 15. And we're not going to take time to explain all of those, but I just want to rattle off who Christ is held up in opposition to syncretism. Chapter 2, verses 9 to 15 tell us Christ is, is the fullness of deity in bodily form, verse 9. Christ is the one who makes you complete, verse 10. Christ is head over rule and authority, verse 10. Christ is the one who circumcises the heart and not just the flesh. Christ is the one you join in baptism, verse 12. Christ is the one who makes you spiritually and eternally alive through the forgiveness of sin, verse 13. Christ is the one who nails your debt to the cross, verse 14. Christ is the one who has disarmed the rulers and authorities and triumphs over them, verse 15. His antidote to this kind of watered-down Christianity is, remember Christ. Young men, young women, faculty and staff and counselors walking in Christ. When I remember that walk with dear Uncle Wilmus and what it means to have the perimeter, the full holistic side of walking with Jesus means that which is rooted in and built upon and established in the truth, which is what Paul means by in the faith and call it the Christ way. And so I close with a wonderful statement from Brother Sam again. And another statement that he shared with me one day, so he's shaping in my life. We were sitting together and discussing that wonderful promise of Jesus you know it probably pretty well in John 8.32 where Jesus says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And Sam said to me, You know, Wes, 
I think too many people want the freedom truth affords without engaging in the hard work of discovering, thereby knowing the truth, who is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, the life. Too many people want the freedom truth affords without engaging in the hard work of knowing the truth. It doesn't just come on a silver platter. You dig, you study, you talk, you engage, you relate to people around you who show you Christ-like truth. Like Wilmus Jehe, Sam Shu, and people sitting right in this room. Oh, men and women, young men and women, please don't give your life to watered-down Christianity. Why would you choose that? It's not worth it. Go for the high bar of the Christ way. Amen. <laughs>